First of all, welcome to Rockhampton, ladies and gentlemen. What a gorgeous bunch of cattle men, bulls, mickeys, heifers and grand dams. A big round of applause for yourselves for coming along tonight. Now, talking about gorgeous bunch of people, ladies and gentlemen, our sponsors is a, a dynamic young company called Lord. That's land, agribusiness, water development. They're a sophisticated real estate agency advisory firm providing valuations, transactional advice and strategic consultancy for the development of land and agribusiness. And it, with John McKillop at the helm, what could possibly go wrong? So a round of applause for Lord, who sponsored tonight's debate. Now, a few of the ground rules. The topic of tonight's debate, an age-old question will be answered right here in this room, that are males more romantic? Each speaker has eight minutes approximately to state their case. We've got to try and keep Fredo down under 15 if we can. And then, then one from each side will summarise in a two-minute summary at the end to drive their argument home. We added a little extra flair in tonight's debate, ladies and gentlemen, where each side have got a mystery word that we're just going to tell them right now, and if they're able to slot that in their presentation, they will gain bonus points. So on the right here, for the affirmative, the mystery word, or words, is inverted nipple. For, for the negative, their words, strangulated testicle. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, whenever you, if, if they are able to slot that in, give that a big cheer if you can hear that. One thing while they're thinking about their presentations now, I might take you back to 2009 and do a revamped version of something we did in a debate in this very hall way back then. And it was called the marriage, it was a race call. It was called the marriage handicap for young colts, soon to be geldings and frustrated fillies. Bride and groom moving in. Bride out of proud mare, side by pick up the tab dad. Groom looks a little eager in the mounting yard, starting to sweat up a little. Bride looks a treat, surely the crowd favorite set for this one. Past girlfriend, a late and definite scratching, she never made the card. The groom moves in, preacher to his stand. Organ light on, they look set, I do. Married now, newlyweds away well with I love you Stookums, along with I love you Stookums, you're my soul mate and you completely complete me. Half length back to moonlit dinner, picnic in the park and romantic walk settling into stride. They come around the honeymoon suite now with Gee, you've lost weight, they're nice shoes, you've got a great bum, all lead to French maid costume. Giddy up, you're the king, and who's your daddy with a bit of hard riding? <laughs> On settling, get a mortgage, buy the house with furniture shopping, two containers back. Making a move now as she wants kids. Are you sure? Shut up and keep going. She, she pulls the whip and I start responding well. In a great blunder, I say, your mother's a great help. She's so caring when she coming to stay, followed by what was I thinking? They go past the post for the first time. Morning sickness is first up. Along comes Junior, apple of our eye, and he looks like daddy gets a bit of a run. The pace is slowed, and oh, goodness gracious me. Boys' night out has had a fall and will be put down never to be ever to race again. Pub crawl, rugby trip, and golf clubs have all been badly affected. Quickly taking up their positions is sleepless nights, crappy nappy, and art gallery. From nowhere comes, take the kids this week, closely healed by my career is important too, you know. They come around the 10th anniversary mark with three kids in the stable and a second mortgage. The ground is heavy going. Interest rates is now on the move along with fuel prices. Smokes and beer move up, while share, share market and backyard blitz is causing a real headache. 
Facebook gets a run nine times a day and regular sex has dropped out to last. <laughs> Down the back straight, but I'm so romantic, I fed the dog, picked up me undies, got you a socket set for Mother's Day, and you're so hard to please. <laughs> up goes the tempo, I make a move, dropping the towel and doing the helicopter with only half a length. <laughs> and back comes, you've got a small rotor. Checked badly by Black Hawk Down, I've got a Black Hawk Down. <laughs> they come around the 15 year mark and it looks like the marriage is moving off the rails. Your mates come first, you're never home and you never do anything around the house or rear their heads, closely trailed by your old girlfriend's a dog. They're, they're not real, you know. And why can't you be more like Freddo? They drive each other around the bend and swing for home, or dare I say, the family house. Mother-in-law is four wide, but then again, she always was. <laughs> Joint bank, bank account gets a touch-up, along with superannuation fund. Petty cash is gone, and mother-in-law gets another check. That's the fourth this week. 200 out, she makes a run. Don't touch me, I faked it, and the kids aren't yours. Coming back gamely as you've got a fat ass, I slept with your sister and your mother's a witch. <laughs> Here comes up yours, I hate you, you scum-sucking bottom feeder. I'm a lawyer, pokes his nose in front, another scum-sucking bottom feeder. They hit it, oh, it's too close to call. The family court judges have called for the photo. Yes, correct weight. First placing, I'm a lawyer, came from nowhere. Second placing, she got the house in 65%. And third place, bad luck, buddy, you're in the doghouse. <laughs> All the kids came stone fatherless last and fair play didn't get in the picture. <laughs> that, by the way, has no relevance to anyone here tonight. So, uh, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker from the affirmative, local legend and veteran of the beef debating circuit, Dr. Fredo Keating. <laughs> Fredo has now retired and getting older. He does concede he is growing hair in the most unlikely places, such as out of his nostrils, out of his ear canal, and most pr proficiently between over, under, and around his bum. <laughs> hard. Hard, hard to cop, really. He openly admits when he runs naked from the bathroom to the boudoir, it now resembles black caviar rounding the bend of Mooney Valley. <laughs> he proudly boasts, and he told me this personally, he said he's invented the South American pelvic mullet. And I said, What's the South American pelvic mullet? He said, Brazilian in the front, Amazon out the back. <laughs> that was a good one, Alison, Got that one down. <laughs> Since we saw him last, you'll be pleased to know, Fredo, the great entrepreneur, has released his own fragrance. Unfortunately, there were three other people in the car at the time. As far as romance goes, Freddo's better half will testify that Freddo, that old fuddy-duddy, used to get into a bit of argy-bargy when looking for some hanky-panky for his willy-nilly. <laughs> but she confirmed that he regularly went looking for a bit of how's your father, thinking it would be Bob's your uncle, only resulting in not on your nelly. <laughs> she then went on to say, he's more of a jumping jack flash rather than a Johnny come lately. <laughs> and, and most of that was on his Pat Malone. <laughs> a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Fred O'Keating. Jeffrey. Jeffrey, Jeffrey. You're a super spreader. 
and I'm not talking fairy dust. <laughs> but a little bit of housekeeping keeping before we kick off, ladies and gentlemen. We're on, in unprecedented times, as you well know, and the organisers of Beef uh, 2021 have at, had to exercise an abundance of caution and request that throughout that you follow all the COVID protocols here, protocols here this evening and that you also behave in a carbon neutral, environmentally sensitive way by please not belching or farting during the course. <laughs> Can I say, just as a complete aside before we start, that uh, I hope you agree with me that the, the two ladies up here with us uh, this evening in their black look, look radiant and I'd wonder if you'd just give them a round of applause. They compliment the crowd. I looked through the crowd there before and there's some very attractive, uh, very winsome uh, ladies here. But we do have a couple of bats, old bats down here in the, uh, in the front row because here we are all together in the Wandle wet market. <laughs> like lots of you folks who've come a long way to join us here in Rocky uh, this year, I suppose you've had to, uh, to battle uh, the drought and times have been tough and for, for, uh, for Jeffrey, uh, no, no less so than all of you, he's really had to struggle to put uh, food on the family table and had to think of every, everything to make a quid because uh, the climate was so much against him. <clears throat> and in desperation someone one, uh, at one stage said to him, Jeffrey, why don't you try underwear modelling? <laughs> and he thought I could give that a crack. Uh, you know, it was, very, it was technically very difficult for the, uh, for the photographer because no matter what camera angle he used or what light setting he, he fixed, everything seemed to make Jeffrey's bum look big. <laughs> it was bad enough for him, but, but his little assistant, her job was to, was, was to do all the touching up. Uh, and that, that, that really was a challenge. It looked more, less like budgie smugglers in the front bit than, a, than a tr trying to get a couple of possums out of a, out of a corn bag. It had a life of its own down there. <laughs> but can I tell you, that as a complete aside, when Jeffrey was a young bloke growing up down there in the Calide Valley, there was a young woman who lived down there to whom Mother Nature hadn't been terribly kind. She looked a bit like, like Kim Kardashian. She had a face like Farlap and a bum like Maccabi Diva. <laughs> but to add insult to injury, the poor thing was born with only one breast. And it was in the middle of a back up between the shoulder blades. She was bloody hideous to look at, but fantastic to dance with. <laughs> and you wouldn't want to know it, on the top of the breast was an inverted nipple. <laughs> <laughs> now that year at the, uh, at the jam bin, Deb, Deb Ball, the debutante's ball, Jeffrey made sure he elbowed his way to the front of the queue so he could nail this girl to uh, during the course of the Pride of Erin. And he had a wonderful time dancing the Pride of Erin with this girl. He loved the waltzing bit particularly. But all the while throughout the dance, as, uh, as, as Jeff uh, danced with her, the nipple remained inverted. <laughs> he didn't want the music to stop, but it had to eventually. Um, but even though the nipple remained inverted then, the next bracket was the progressive barn dance and it popped out a few times during the course of that. <laughs> you know, the explanation as to why the nipple didn't pop up with Jeffrey, uh, you could speculate on. My own belief is um, Jeffrey hasn't got the bill for ballroom dancing and it's the stuff of nightmares to think of, uh, of Jeffrey twerking line dancing, pole dancing, or lap dancing. And I think the reason uh, the, the whole show didn't fly for, for Jeff at that stage was the same reason the photo shoot didn't work, and that was because of his scrotal circumference. <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> but uh, look, can I introduce uh, my colleagues on this side? Chris Hills, you've, you've met before. Chris. Uh, uh, repeatedly over the years has um, informed us of the sort of technical and the, tac the tactical uh, um, uh, aspects of her love life. But uh, since then, she's had a change to her team roster. 
and I think she's probably had a couple of positional changes, <laughs> such that... Um, Swam outside, <laughs> <laughs> outside the flags, but she knows now that men certainly can, uh, can be more, roman uh, more romantic than women, and more romantic than they used to be. Sam, welcome back to the Festival of Protein. Thank you, uh, Sam, as you well know, is our... <laughs> ..is Australia's lay ambassador, but at least he's not vegetarian. And you can understand the sort of cult status Sam's got across the Dutch in New Zealand. And he had a recent interlude down in Melbourne before he came up here. There was a couple of uh, New Zealand farmhands, um, you know, took, took uh, use of the travel bubble. Uh, so uh, they came over to Melbourne to have a bit of a look. And uh, they were coming away from St Kilda, an area that uh, Sam would know well, where they'd been to a brothel. These blokes were Biven and Trevor from Fucker Whopper in the Bay of Plenty. <laughs> and Bevan says to Trevor, what did you think about sex with a woman, uh, Trevor? And Bevan says, uh, sweet ass, sweet ass. He said, but not as good as the real thing. <laughs> they were in their rental car and they got caught in one of those intersections in Melbourne where you got to do the hook turn and they, they, you didn't quite get the, the message on the hook turn drove the car across two, two, two tram lines, they've, they've, they've held the trams up both ways, traffic's in chaos, someone had to do something, Sa Sam's on, on, on the footpath having a cup of coffee, so he had to sort this out, so he strode manfully into the intersection and bellowed at these blokes, where the bloody hell do you think you're going? And the bloke said, we're trying to get to the stock exchange. They really wanted to have a look and see what happens at the stock exchange. Like the, like the couple of Kiwis who thought the Canning Stock Route was an annual event. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Sam roared at this bloke, he said, can you make a U-turn? And the fellow said, no, I can't, but Bevan can make him go cross-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> and Sam said, oh, go to buggery. <laughs> now, that wasn't the right thing to say because they, they, they followed him around all afternoon because <laughs> it turned out they were ringers. Now yeah, look, ladies and gentlemen, my wife Penelope says I'm a hopeless lover, but I think what she really means is I'm a hopeless romantic. It's pretty much the same sort of thing. She gets flowers every week if they're on sale. <laughs> and on our honeymoon, just for a bit of pillow talk, I said to her, darling, am I the first one? She said, yes, all the others were eight, nine and ten. <clears throat> I wake up every morning and I say to her, darling, you're the reason I get out of bed every morning. She gets a funny look in her face. She'd, she'd faint if she wasn't lying down. But look, we've had, uh, we've had 40 years of, of marital bliss and I can still taste her around the bedroom. In fact, I lapped her twice the other night. <laughs> but in all honesty, she's a very dignified and refined and graceful person. And in preparation for this evening, I was thinking of what I might say and, you know, how I'd better be careful that I don't embarrass myself or herself or offend anyone. So I said to myself, what would Penny say? What would Penny say? And then I thought, bugger it, what would, Stan, what would Sam say? And then a, a big weight lifted off my shoulders. <laughs> now, those opposite, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a good mate of Simon Irwin's, but can I tell you he's an emotionally blunted sort of fellow. He doesn't have a romantic bone in his body. He's more an utter man than a titty bloke, if you know what I mean. <laughs> his wife rang him during the course of Valentine's Day recently and she said, Simon, the other three girls in the office here have had beautiful bouquets of flowers delivered to them today. She said, they're gorgeous. And he said, that'd be why. Can I tell you, the only way a girl would get a bunch of flowers out of Simon would be to pass away. <laughs> now, Tahir here has only been here a very brief time, but I can sense that he's already impressed with the sort of down-to-earth country life, that the sort of thing that happens up here, seeing as he's, he's jumped the, the, the hipster-proof hipster fence down there in, in um, uh, Bankstown. He's particularly impressed with the stories of outback courtship rituals. 
particularly the one which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, where the male and the female drink a lot of Bundaberg rum and the bloke slaps the girl on the, girl on the ass and says, okay, da uh, okay, Tubby, Dax down, you're next. Now, well, that's a very efficient use of time and energy. Uh, and it's a sort of a, it's speed dating and romance in, in a glorious union. And if the whole show goes longer than eight seconds, they ring a bell and you win a sash. Sometimes the earth moves. <laughs> now, if you think about it, consent is assumed, Congress is immediate, and it's all more sincere because not a word is spoken. And the absolute country gentleman removes his hat before he starts. <laughs> In reality, that's not such an unusual coupling technique. It's nothing revolutionary or new. They've been doing that in federal parliament in Canberra. It's known as the Liberal Party technique. <laughs> That's why they call it the coalition party room. <laughs> now, Anna here, local girl, one of, one of our very own. She's a, the author of a lovely little book called Girl In Between. And as you can see, Anna's a very attractive, vibrant, earnest, modern young woman. But on the form in the book, she's no John, Jane Eyre or Emily Bronte. In the book, there's no Mr. Darcy and not even a Mr. Big. The book is really 50 shades of white. <laughs> There's not a syllable of intrigue or passion or seduction. There's no heaving bosoms. There's no cleavage. There's no flimsy negligee. There's no bodice ripping. There's no fumbling with buttons or zips or bras. There's no sigh of a satisfied virgin. There's no sizzle. There's no sausage. There's no romance. So as far as chiclet, chick lit goes, it's, a, it's quite a nice little read, but as erotic literature, lit, as a erotic literature it's a real cock-up. <laughs> well, the essence of the argument, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that men are, all, are more romantic than women because we're more desperate, let's face it. <laughs> These days women can, br can even breed without a bloke, so we've got to jostle to get noticed. <laughs> Blokes fight each other for the attention of women, and men tend to be more visual characters and, and love at first sight is, a, is more a man thing than a, than, than a woman thing. We're quicker to fall in love, we're quicker to say we're in love and we fall in love more often. It's a sort of genetic thing and it saves time, like, like premature ejaculation. <laughs> Romance is a matter of life or death for us but it's like going, going shopping for girls. Girls have become predatory and picky and skittish so there's, because there's no need for them to be romantic. Girls these days reckon there's no point buying the, buying the whole pig if all you need's a little sausage. <laughs> all you blokes, all you uh, animal husbandry blokes know that women are funny cattle. Young women can be all sorts of things but romantic because they're so emotionally needy and labile. They can exhibit the whole spectrum of human emotion within an hour, within an hour of waking up in the, every morning. It's, that's why we have mad cow disease. <laughs> Men are far more simpler and predictable. Men have only got two emotional needs. We're either hungry or we're horny. <laughs> so girls, if you see a bloke without an erection, you should toss him a biscuit. Then, of course, comes middle age, and poor women are visited by the seven witches of the menopause. Itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. <laughs> but still, we love you. So, finally, and in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, can I say I'll go to my grave wondering why blokes go through so much anxiety, stress, embarrassment, trouble, and expense to end up getting down on bended knee to put a diamond ring on a girl's finger and in return get a copper one for your own nose. Try and tell me that's not romantic. <laughs> uh, right, a round of applause for Fredo. So next up, ladies and gentlemen, the first speaker for the negative. Needs no introduction. Anna Daniels is a journalist, an author and a broadcaster. Her great passion is championing the stories and characters of rural and regional Australia. 
which he has done on the project ABC TV Channel 7. In 2016, Anna was shortlisted for the Vogel Award for a debut novel, Girl in Between. Since its release, Girl in Between has become one of Australia's best-selling debut novels. It is also available on audiobook at all good stores. <laughs> and it also has been published in Germany and distributed through the UK and the USA. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rockhampton's favourite daughter, Anna Daniels. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Look, can I start by pointing out the average age of this side on my right is 102. <laughs> Talk about romance and going weak at the knees. <laughs> nice, nice. Talk about romance and going weak at the knees. I don't know if you saw, but Sam was flat out getting up these stairs earlier let alone getting down to Serenade you, God help us. I ran into him last night, and let me assure you, ladies, his idea of romance is a night out at the Frenchville Sports Club in front of the slots. I saw him squinting up at the, the Kino screen whilst the lovely lady beside him was calling out the numbers. Then they shared a lamb backstrap before he shouted her a VB at the bar, a packet of Winnie Blues and a maxi taxi home. I was almost going to jump in and help out this damsel in distress until I saw that it was Christine Hills. <laughs> Clearly, Christine has been blindsided by these two clueless Casanovas, and look where she's wound up, over there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, talk about love and affection. The only stroke these people here know is two-stroke. A love bite for them is a nip from a Kelpie. When you ask this mob to go get some essential oils, they'll bring back Castrol Synthetic and Penrite. <laughs> and if you're up for a walk in the rain, it'll be as they check the boundaries on their property. This side will have you believe that all men are raging Romeos, whining and dining and wooing and pursuing. It's hard to swallow when they think that a romantic comedy is having a laugh with Pip Courtney during Landline. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you're going to hear so much bluster and baloney, there'll be more porky pies than out the back of Cranston's drive through But let me assure you that we must cut through to the truth and ignore everything this Lambassador says. Sure, he may look like a benevolent grandfather, but let me assure you, Sam is a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's going to go for the jugular. And with choppers like those, he's probably going to come close. <laughs> but how can we trust a man who lives and breathes lamb? Out here in Beef Week and in the midst of us is a bloke who's never had a piece of steak in his life. Wouldn't know a rump, it's all about the chump. Chump chops. Earlier tonight, we all had dinner. And I innocently turned to Sam and said, how's your short loin? Well, he looked aghast. The language of beef cuts clearly foreign to a man who only deals in legs, breasts and four shanks. <laughs> Giving him a bit of beef, I explained that I was being tongue in cheek, but he gave me the cold shoulder, which was cry of act from his sheep farm in Victoria. <laughs> Naturally, I said no shanks, <laughs> which, <laughs> which look, brings me to everything Fredo said. You'd think a kindly former doctor like Fredo would have a soft touch. And according to the legions of men who presented to him with strangulated testicles and hemorrhoids, <laughs> he did. But that softness has left Fredo everywhere but around the belly and the hips. It's a sad reality that when COVID came along, Fredo rejoiced. No more pressure to hold hands. And just this morning even, still wearing a face shield, went out for coffee with Penny to protect against public displays of affection. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I also couldn't believe that your speech went for 18 minutes and that half of it was about Jeff Maynard twerking. <laughs> Which brings me to my first argument tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, women are more romantic than men because we do it more. Why? 
because we're the ultimate multitaskers. Women can toast their partner whilst also taking the toaster apart. They can make out whilst making the bed and a lasagna. Women are not only initiating melting moments, they're also baking them. Tray after tray of sensual cookie dough, drowning out the smell of boots drenched in horse manure and pesticides. Ladies, you'll know, if you make a move on a man whilst he's watching the weather report, you'll be greeted with shock, disbelief and fear. How can he possibly look at you whilst also keeping an eye on Jenny Woodward? <laughs> it's impossible. And that's why we females take charge, learning from the femme fatales who went before us. Some of us, let's be honest, most of us, learnt the hard way, observing good old mom pa. Unlike some of these blow-ins, I grew up in Rocky, and every weekend I'd observe mum and dad take turns in arranging romantic getaways. When it was mum's turn, they'd go to Pacino's for a candlelit dinner, and then they'd walk hand in hand beside the river on Key Street before watching the twinkling lights from the top of Mount Archer as love song dedications gently came through the Tarago speakers. <laughs> then next weekend, it was Dad's turn. Well, they started out at the Gracemere sale yards before grabbing a pie and a chalky milk at the Mount Morgan Bakery and heading to the Rocky Swap to pick up some boat trailer tyres and a second-hand homebrew kit. Then it was back over the bridge for two for one pints at the Lakes Creek Hotel with Fredo and Penny. <laughs> Need I say more? Probably not, because I'm staying at Mum and Dad's tonight. But look, you get the picture, don't you? Men, as the 15 million copy bestseller says, men are from Mars bars, women are from Venus. Books don't lie. You only have to look at the mountain of rural romance or lust in the dust books out there to see that they're all written by women. Titles like Northern Heat by Helene Young, Animal Magnetism by Jill Shalvis, and my favourite, A Rose Between Two Thorns by Christine Hills, show that it takes a, a woman and who knows a thing or two when the curtains are drawn to write about romance. Men, meanwhile, are putting out books like Butte Utes, Burgers Made Easy, and Insults Every Man Should Know. And I know you're looking at me thinking, who is she to talk about books? Well, I'll tell you, I wrote one. It's a romantic comedy set amongst the bull statues and cattle trains of Rockhampton. And coincidentally, I'm doing a book signing of it tomorrow morning at a place called Our Shop in William Street. But that's beside the point, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it, Fredo? Look, you lot might think that when we're on our laptops that we're looking up scone recipes from the CWA. But let's be honest, we're all watching Outlander. That hard pressed to find any sort of romance from the opposite sex that we resort to a steamy series starring a Scottish warrior in a well-cut kilt. Based, of course, on the best-selling books by the all-knowing Diana Gabaldon. Ladies and gentlemen, if TV's more your thing, you only have to switch on the box and look at what's offering to see that females are more romantic. Case in point, farmer wants a wife. Males so lacking in the romance department that they've hoisted the white flag in surrender and said, God help me, I've tried myself, but I really do need a national reality TV show to win someone over. <laughs> Tonight, you're gonna hear from two fine men who've come to know and embrace the truth, that they don't have a romantic bone in their body. Simon Irwin was born in Warwick and is a former general manager of Rocky's Morning Bulletin. Any more salt of the earth and you'd sprinkle him on your fish and chips. <laughs> and to hear, well, everything to hear says tonight will be gospel. Look, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, let's not beat around the bush because men certainly aren't. I mean, in the words of the famous romantic diva, Pat Benatar, love is a battlefield, a battle which we will win tonight. Thank you. Keep it going, ladies and gentlemen, for Anna Daniels. <clears throat> Our next speaker for the affirmative, 
again, also needs no introduction, Christine Hills. It has been said many times that she's a mix of Margaret Thatcher, Lady Diana and Mother Teresa. Without the Lady Diana and Mother Teresa bits. Chris openly admits she's been wined, dined, wooed, cooed, courted, romanced, honoured, exalted, hoisted, revered, cherished, adored, admired, venerated, regarded, worshipped and wrapped in bubble wrap <laughs> by men all her life. She has been desperate to be on the affirmative side to outline to us all tonight how she's been riding the Ferrari of female privilege up and down Easy Street. Please, a big hand for Christine Hill. Well, thank you, Jeff. And it's great to be back at the great debate at Beef Week. If for no other reason than I'd get to cop that lovely public pasting from your good self. And you're welcome, Jeff, for the visit from the Prime Minister yesterday to your Senapol tent. We'd taken him to see the tallest cattle at the Brahmin exhibit and wanted to, to see what the short ones looked like. <laughs> and no doubt there will be some intellectual flack thrown from my esteemed debating arch nemesis, Mr Simon, don't mention Rupert Murdoch Irwin. Fortunately, I have the godfather of comedy on my side tonight, Dr. Fredo Keating, who, even though he is apparently styling himself on a small chocolate frog, is without a doubt one of the wittiest ex-medicos in this great city. And if you don't mind, Fredo, I might even address the topic and stay within my time limits. When I heard the topic tonight, I was exhilarated. I mean, what girl in Rockhampton hasn't pondered the great questions of the day? Do I really have to go over to the north side? <laughs> what day will winter be on this year? And why are men so oblivious about romance? But then I found out I was on the affirmative side. Thank you, Geoffrey, for screw turning the screws of irony on me. But then it occurred to me that my partner, the illustrious Scott Buchholz, somewhat concerned about what might have been revealed here tonight if I was on the negative team, has offered a fresh 20k bitumen rehash from the front Maynard gate into the sunny downtown township of Jambin. Well played, my love. From the start, I want to state that romance is not new to me. I spent many of my formative years studying the most handy of degrees, a Bachelor of Arts in Literature, rendering myself virtually unemployable. <laughs> Heady days, those. Hours spent reading from the canon of literature and comparing all and sundry to a summer's day. In an attempt to make something of my life, I chose teaching and went to the verdant academic grounds of the University of Queensland, where even the forward pack could sprout the odd line of Shakespeare. It was dimly lit bars, soothing jazz chords, and glasses of champagne over genteel discussions about the classics. Then I was transferred to Emerald. Imagine my surprise when I accepted the invitation of the older teachers at Emerald State High School to experience the joys of the local nightlife on the first Friday night of the academic year. Now, Emerald is not without its classy and sophisticated venues, particularly the aptly named Fanny's Nightclub. Clearly, the Saba boys did not want the locals to be confused about the purpose of the place. <laughs> there, in the midst of the rum fumes, cigarette smoke and the odd expletive, could be seen the most unlikely gathering of CQ's finest. Scott, hello brother, Buchholz, 
the somewhat enigmatic and slightly dangerous Daniel's Boys from Gindi, the ever eloquent and literary Fats Donaldson, and other randoms from the Emerald Rams Rugby Union Club. Not much Shakespeare in that front line, ladies. It was clear I was not at UQ anymore. The first beverage I was offered at the Star Hotel was accompanied with the honeyed words, can you hold my beer for me, love? I have to take a leak. <laughs> the second was with the immortal line, you look like you'd go all right. Do you want to debate for the Young Nationals, mate? It's not that my heart skipped a beat, I think it cracked. But many years of life in central Queensland has taught me that romance is relative and that indeed our wonderful men are up to the cause. Maybe because this is of our preoccupation with beef and it creates a highly sexually charged environment. Consider this. The Brahmin boys like to point out their best in the humping stakes. The Santa breeders like to espouse the superiority of their scrotal circumferences. And the Charolais men talk up semen count and publish it for all to see. How could a girl resist? Then they back in with some of the most romantic gestures, some gathered from a bit of research I did with some of my female friends. From up Clark Creek Way, there's more than wind turbines driving the energy up there, people. With a Christmas gift of a chainsaw to the missus so she wouldn't have to keep asking for the trees to be pruned. Or the esteemed grazier from Alpha, who noted he creates time with his beloved by taking her with him on the lick run so that she can open the gates. <laughs> and then there's the story about the bloke from Baralabar who proposed to his wife by spelling the words marry me out in rocks in the paddock. I wonder who had to pick them up after that. <laughs> All the moment. You thought you were a bit special because the dog was put into the back of the ute. Dog etiquette is something that clearly shows the softness in our men, as I remember hobbling out to the ute one day nine months pregnant to see the door slowly being opened from the inside to let the pregnant bitch in. <laughs> Bessie, it seems, was always the favourite in the family. Anna Daniels, a low-key rocky girl herself, knows what a nursery of romance this great city is. Hundreds of its products have gone forth from one of the greatest educational institutions in this area, St. Brendan's College, to weave their magic. I know this from my years as principal of Girls' Grammar where the mere mention of a visit from the boys in green sent the boarders racing back to Collar House to remove their signature, I don't care about my hair, top knot, and re-emerge with GHD-inspired sleekness and more than a hint of lip gloss, usually accompanied with a trip from the fire department because they had set off every alarm in the building. St. Brendan's has a lot to answer for. Not only in the form of some of its colourful graduates, Timmy Kirkwood, Rob Sherry, the Comiskey clan, James Nasser, Tim Bonges, the illustrious Maguire boys from Emerald, and of course my own great love, but also about how they managed to squeeze 5,762 boys into every year level given that every second person we ran into here this week was either in the same class, the one above, or the one below. I swear the only institution with a more successful enrolment plan was the Emerald Pastoral College. But despite these wonderful experiences of romance in the beef capital, nothing prepared me for being the partner of a politician. Now, before I go down this road, I want to put in a disclaimer. This is a comedy debate. It relies on satire and possibly a little exaggeration. See the previous Bessie the Dog story. 
So before I begin, if there are any reporters here tonight from Four Corners gathering dirt for the next expose on a government minister, <laughs> this recreation of the Minister for Freight Transport may not stand up to a libel case. But then I am reminded that we are north of Brisbane, so anyone from Four Corners is very unlikely to be here. People don't think politicians are very romantic, do they, David Littleproud? I mean, Peter Dutton is hardly the face that launched a thousand candlelit dinners. And yet, their world is wonderfully romantic. What could be more heartwarming than a Thursday night in front of the television with a cup of hot chocolate as we settle in to watch Q&A? There's nothing more beautiful than taking in the fair and balanced intellectual debate from the ABC's flagship program, or to see the likes of Sarah Hansen Young lecture farmers about bovine gas emissions and the need to eat more plants. Yes, it is a regular love-in. Can't begin to tell you what a Sunday morning lion watching the insiders looks like. And that assumes we get to have a sleep in and haven't been woken up at the crack of dawn by a cranky owner operator who is ringing to, link to let the Minister for Freight Transport know that one of his trucks has broken down, down outside of Gunnedah and he can't get spares in until Monday and what are you going to bloody do about it? But little can compete with the joy and excitement of the unlimited junkets and trips to the exotic places that you hear these politicians get to take their wives to. I can tell you firsthand the thrill of attending the 73rd annual Truck Bolts and Widgets dinner <laughs> in Wagga Wagga with the guest speaker Bob, who has 55 years experience in greasing nipples. which made sense and induced a sigh of relief when the term was explained to me. I had assumed that Bob's missus had an issue with inverted nipples. <laughs> what could be more appealing than being crammed into a Mitsubishi Pajero Sports, because that's the last car that was left in Mount Isa, with arguably the largest member of parliament, to observe the state of potholes in the roads with a group of mayors from the north who spend hundreds of kilometres arguing about who's got the biggest one. <laughs> Pothole, that is. <laughs> Nothing as bad as the May Downs Road, said no one who's ever been on the Utan Highway. Then there's the magical gifts I am showered with when he comes back from one of his incursions into the deep north. Nothing screams I love you more than a stay another day in Richmond stubby cooler <laughs> or to unwrap a welcome to Cloncurry trucker's hat. <laughs> Except possibly for the Kenworth sponsored Black & Decker drill bit set I received for my birthday one year. Apparently because I never would know when I might need one along with a Scott Buchholz logo polo shirt from the office, so I feel like I'm really a member of the team. Even my 15-year-old son raised an eyebrow at that one. It has pride of place next to my miniature Volvo 70th anniversary replica B-double and the ironically named Motorex antifreeze snow globe as I add them to the gift register that is poured over by the press, I think, how romantic is this? And so it's clear, ladies and gentlemen, life is what you make it, and romance it is, is in the eye of the beholder. Given that we women are pretty uncomplicated and so easy to please, it is absolutely possible that if we close our eyes and wish really hard the man in our life may actually be our Prince Charming.
keep it going for Christine, ladies and gentlemen. Great job. I did mention to you tonight's debate was sponsored by a dynamic company called Lord. I did mention that, didn't I? That's twice. That's part of my regulations. Uh, a sophisticated real estate agency advisory firm providing valuations, transactional advice and strategic consultancy for the development of land and agribusiness. So thank you very much, Lord. We appreciate that. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, for the negative, Simon Irwin. He himself is known as the Fabio of Gracemere, the Pepe Le Pew of Pink Lily. He's a crooner, he's a swooner, and at old rugby parties, he probably was the mooner. In his day, his charismatic charms knew no bounds. Legend has it, on a long, fruitful night of courting, he made Edna Creek, he then made Vicky Park, <laughs> and lastly, he made Grace Smear. <laughs> Lipstick. On a dim, lit, starry night, sometimes he can be seen galloping a white Arab stallion across the flats of the Yepin Crossing only wearing a pair of chaps. With his long flowing locks glistening in the moonlight, he is preparing to get a skin graft for Freddo's bum. <laughs> Locals believed it was a desperate dash of passion to be back home with his one true love, or he just got pissed at the Pony Club breakup. We're not sure. <laughs> Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Simon Irwin. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaf hath all too short a date. Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, this is the view of the world that our opponents are trying to tell you exists out there amongst us all. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Now, ladies in the audience, is there any one of you sitting there who thinks your man is walking around having thoughts like this during the day? <laughs> or having thoughts like this ever, <laughs> ever? It doesn't happen. The concept of males being remotely interested in romance is rubbish. It's all about semen. <laughs> how much of it and how far and wide you can spread it. <laughs> Millions of years of evolution since we crawled out of the primordial slime, males have been programmed to spread their seed as far and wide and quickly as they can. How far can I spread my genes before I drop off the perch? That's got nothing to do with romance. Now, as our chairman knows, nothing ruins a good morning scratch like a strangulated testicle. <laughs> Likewise, nothing will ruin our opponent's arguments quicker than looking at the science. A look at the facts. Now, I will admit I was slightly perplexed when Fred O'Keating, as a man of science, a medical man, is standing up for the idea of romance. Uh, with his unbelievably excellent knowledge of human reproduction, um, because he'd been retired for an hour, a while now, so Fredo is actually living on his, uh, his wits and his pension, both of which are hopelessly inadequate. <laughs> he is not by nature or by profession a romantic. And I think it was demonstrated that the uh, medicine's not a very romantic profession anyway. Fredo only ever really contributed one paper to the furtherment of science. And that was to a conference at the Jupiter's Casino in 1989 titled Wet Concrete Causation or a Statistical Anomaly 
which was given to a conference on the treatment of hemorrhoids. Uh, in, that, uh, in that conference, that paper, he also presented a new method of treatment for hemorrhoids, which became known as the Keating treatment. Uh, in all honesty, um, a bit like the boxes of Gibson New Leaf toilet paper in school when I was a kid, it never really got much traction. Uh, Fredo seemed to always maintain that the reason it never caught on was that the medical profession, very conservative and very loath to change to new and innovative forms of therapy for disease, um, Personally, I always thought that it was because the Keating treatment for haemorrhoids consisted of getting the patient to eat cheese for three days and sit in a rat's nest. <laughs> anyway, back to the science. Let us, ladies and gentlemen, consider the lion, the king of beasts. According to the Encyclopaedia Britannica, a lion will mate up to a hundred times a night with a single female who is in season. They keep that up for three or four days that the estrus lasts. However, each individual mating lasts 17 seconds. So ladies, I leave it up to you to decide if that's a fair deal. It sounded a fair bit to, to hear and I. Of course, uh, Sam used to play uh, Australian rules with, uh, with North Melbourne and Collingwood, so he thinks a hundred times a night's just simply an ordinary mad Monday after the grand final. <laughs> Closer to home, an active breeding bull will breed up to 20 times a day. Although it is worth knowing for anybody who's going to emulate that in the audience, uh, it's not with the same cow. A relief, I'm sure, to everybody in the audience. The speed of that mating has everything to do with genetic requirements, not romance, and under two minutes is the average. Some dairy breeds and beef breeds with higher levels of fecundity, like centipoles, will mate even faster. Indeed, closer to home, the average time of human males taken the act of Congress is 5.4 minutes, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the average. And I must point out that even as people start to resemble their pets, breeders of cattle will start to take on some of the characteristics of the breeds <laughs> they're doing. In fact, it's got to the stage now where some breeders of centipole, not too far from here, have managed to truncate the time and the mating process, which in the classics is re referred to as from arousal to refraction, or as it's known in Jambin, from the Yawake Dal <laughs> to the early start tomorrow nighty night, <laughs> has become so brief it can be summed up as an approach titled, This Won't Hurt Much, Did It? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the science, the science is in about how gen genetics and evolution preclude romance. And even when men do try and be romantic, it invariably doesn't go well. I was reminded the other day when Chris started going out with Scotty Buchholz, and Scotty was down in Canberra at a sitting of Parliament, and he knew Valentine's Day was coming up, so he thought, oh God, I better do something about this. So he rushed into Maya and got some lovely gloves, which he uh, was sending up to uh, to Christine, put a little letter in the packet and sent it up. Unfortunately, at the same time, someone was buying some very frilly and little knickers uh, for their beloved and the packages got mucked up. So when uh, Christine got the, uh, the parcel, she opened it up, there's the frilly knickers and here was this lovely handwritten note from Scotty. My darling Christine, he began, this is an incredibly special gift just for you because I notice when you're, you are not in the habit of wearing any when we go out. <laughs> I would have chosen the ones with buttons, but the sales girl said the short ones are better because they are easier to remove. <laughs> These are a very lovely shade. A lady in the store where I purchased them showed me the pair she had been wearing for the past three weeks. 
and they were hardly soiled. I had her try these on for me and they look wonderful. I'm sorry I can't be there to watch you put them on for the first time. No doubt other hands will come in contact with them before I have the chance to see you again. When you take them off, remember to blow on them lightly before putting them away, as they will naturally be a little damp from wearing. Just think how many times I will be kissing them in the future. I hope you will wear them on Friday night for me. Love, your Scott. P.S. P.S. The sales lady says the latest style is to wear them folded down with just a little fur showing. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, as a non-romantic part of the species, I'm sure you would all agree it's much better for the males to leave that part of the world alone. I should add, ladies and gentlemen, that... Uh, Everything I've learned about this topic came from Anna's book, Girl in Between, <laughs> available at uh, bookstores everywhere. Uh, please buy it in hardback. I'm told authors do better out of that than they do on Kindle. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the object here is not to win tonight. We don't want to be... Yeah, I think the concept of winners... Yeah, trying to pick a winner here is wrong because... At the moment of ejaculation, millions and millions of sperm are released into a really unfriendly environment that tries to kill them, absolutely tries to kill them. They are not built to survive in it. So the sperm swim as fast and as hard as they can up through this terrible, terrible place. And at the end of it, one sperm breaks through and reaches the egg. 22 hours later, that's where we all started. So if you look at it that way, ladies and gentlemen, we are all winners here tonight. <laughs> Putting the idea of romance behind us, ladies and gentlemen, I will hope you join us in telling our opposition to forget about all that and simply go forth and multiply. <laughs> Keep it going for Simon, ladies and gentlemen. Really well done. Our next guest, again, needs no introduction. He is the ambassador. He's an AFL legend. He was here last time and we got him back because you know it makes sense. Please give him a good welcome, Sam Kekovic. Very good, boys and girls. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You know, last night I was masticating on my 16-point rack of lamb and I was washing it down with a firkin of my favourite grape and I was musing this phenomenon, which is, who's the greater romantic? Now, you've heard element from both sides and I think the one thing you would concur with me and the one thing that has kept this country in retrograde is that the propensity and the temerity of the opposition to slander, to disparage, to demean and defile speakers of the opposition without coming out with pertinent points. And I think that is such a, such a demerit. But you know, what you've heard so far is pure speculation from both sides. You know, I remember some two years ago, and if I may just digress, Chris made reference to, and it's a difficult topic to confront in previous times. But of course, in contemporary times, you know, and all the more credit to him for being so strong about it. And that is the issue of premature ejaculation. Now, Chris has suffered with this for some time and he finally managed to gather the strength to do something about it. So he rang up the clinic 
went to the clinic, dropped his pants, showed his penis and said to her, he said, look, I've got an issue with premature ejaculation. She said, you sure do. She said, I'm the receptionist. <laughs> but of course, speculation, you need tangible evidence to really be convincing. Now, a couple of years ago, I was having a shower. And I noticed where my boobs were, they were filling with water. And it was, it was a further sign, a further sign, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it was a further sign that my body was changing. And I remember vividly, it was a distinct sign that my inverted nipples <laughs> were manifesting into gender fluidity. So what I'm saying to you in simple layman's terms, I've lived both sides of the fence. <laughs> I have been both Sam and I've been Samantha. <laughs> and I'll tell you quite categorically that the role of Sam has been far more romantic than the role of Samantha. <laughs> and I'll leave it to you. For me, you determine it. Think of the enormity of the sacrifices that we make. When we bend down on one knee, seeking the arm of our paramour, pulling out an expensive rock to have to beg, steal and borrow, pay for the expensive reception, pay for the, her family, let her use the best loo in the house, let her keep a dog and a cat, when was the last time you saw a woman going, anyhow, I'll leave that to you to work out later on, but uh, the sacrifice we've made have been enormous. And what do we get in return? I'll tell you, and I've just stipulated them very clearly. We've got a pair of undies at Christmas, a barbecue set of tongs for Father's Day, and a poor hand job with the tenderness of a Bangkok mama saying for your birthday, <laughs> if you're lucky. Now, there's an ancient Tibetan proverb that states, only an enlightened man can be a true lover and an enlightened woman a true ruler. I don't know why I just made that shit up. I've got no idea. <laughs> I've got no idea where that came from. I tell you what, I remember last, well, I came from, you've got to excuse me because we haven't seen an audience of this size for some time in Victoria. <laughs> this is so unique to us. We've been in lockdown and in curfew. Now we know marriage is a wonderful institution. There's a lot of you in this room, like myself, that occasionally swim outside the flags. <laughs> and you would know when you sit down with your wife for 300 days in a row at the dinner table, you run out of conversation. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I sat there, I got a bit chicken and I asked her for a phone number. That's how bad it got in Victoria. <laughs> but look at, the, look at the role that we romantics play. You know, we talk about florists, we talk about chocolates. And what about our act of benevolence, philanthropy, altruism? We take our coats off to let them get, keep them warm. We put our coats to the ground so they don't get their Pradas wet. Think of who the great fashionistas of the world are. Karl Lagerfeld, Yves Saint Laurent, goes on and on. Who do the women have? I'll tell you who they've got. They've got Lady Tarjay <laughs> and of course Countess Kmart. <laughs> and poetry and romance go hand in hand. We've got Shakespeare, Homer, Keats, and the end, it goes on and on. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard a very compelling argument from the affirmative. But further examples, 
of great men romancing women, a beauty and the beast, Quasimodo and Esmeralda. We never hear the reverse, do we? Susan Boyle and George Clooney. <laughs> Rosie O'Donnell and Brad Pitt. We never hear any of that, do we? No. The world has changed. We have become the great romantics. Sure, we incur a bit of undulation every now and again. I have difficulty telling a lie. My wife, the worst thing, gentlemen, is when our trek to the bathroom coincides with our wife. And when she's in the nude, which she was the other night, and she said to me, Sam, you think I've got a fat ass? <laughs> I find it very difficult to lie. I said, yes, darling, you do. But if it's any consolation, I said, it's a very small bathroom. <laughs> yeah, times have changed. But I love Rockhampton. Rockhampton's a beautiful. Very close to my heart, Rockhampton. My first girlfriend came from Rockhampton. My first girlfriend and my first car both had the same name. They're both escorts. <laughs> and I might tell you on a broader scale, I know we do strange things in Victoria, but we're renowned for a bit of cultural hit every now and again. I took my wife to the art gallery. I don't know if you've ever been to an art gallery. Do you have one here? I'm sure you do. Anyhow, we were perambulated around the periphery and I saw these two couple, this couple in fact, two couple, there's a good. I saw this couple perusing this fine piece and it was a very challenging piece. Is that too far? And what it was, it was three black guys in the nude sitting on a park bench. Two of the guys had black penises and the guy in the middle had a pink penis. And I watched them very closely, my wife and I, and I could see they were tad addled and simply confused. And that went on for about 10 or 15 minutes. Then I saw the curator sidle up alongside them. And he said, look, I've been watching you for the last 20 minutes. And I can understand the dilemma you're confronted by. It is a very challenging piece. But if I may be so bold to offer you my opinion on what it represents. You see, the two black guys with the black penises, they represent the emasculation of the black American in a predominantly patriarchal society. And the guy with the pink dick represents the denigration of the gay movement. So he departed, and I could see that they were none the wiser. And then this little guy sidled up alongside them. And he said, look, I've been watching you as well. If I may be so bold, I'll offer you my suggestion. And they said, what would you know about art, you little runt? He said, well, I painted it. <laughs> and I'll tell you one thing now. The two black guys with the black penises in no shape or form do they represent the emasculation of the black American in a predominantly patriarchal society. And the guy in the middle with the pink dick does not represent the denigration of the gay movement. What it simply is, it's three Scottish miners and the one in the middle went home for lunch. So, so yes, it's a bit of shock horror, but. We're talking about real romance in the purest form. <laughs> Which perhaps may be a little bit brutal. I don't know whether that'll gain us many points or many votes. But look, I think as a collective, we've all got a romantic bone in our body. You know, we're a pretty intelligent society and we realise that we respect each other. And if you look at the, uh, the evidence, it's fairly compelling. If you look at the figures, I know Simon's a stickler for uh, giving you statistical advice. 
But the amount of divorces that take place that are perpetrated by women as opposed by men, it is three to one. It is three to one. And the role of the male, and Anna made reference to me, you know, my sexual contribution. Now, let me tell you, and she's probably right now, look, I used to be pretty smart at it once, but I take a blue pill now so I don't roll out of bed. <laughs> but that's all right. And this is where people lose the plot. Because everyone hints everything, everyone thinks, like these to my immediate left, think it all hinges upon that wham bam under the doona. But what about those wonderful intangible qualities like love, respect, all that bullshit? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, you've heard the evidence on both sides. We could. Uh, I'll tell you one little story. In 2010, in 2010, I travelled the world to promote lamb. Now, I know it's beef eggs, but I'm sure you'd, be, you'd accord me a little bit of licence, given the fact that the one common denominator that's prevalent among us is that the farmer and the rural sector have won out handsomely. So over 20 years I've promoted lamb, but in 2010 I went overseas. And I went to America, I even went to Greece. Be plenty of, any Greeks here? No. <laughs> it's a lovely country, Greece, let me tell you, but rooted. I spoke at two functions in Athens. They paid me in cash and it bounced. So, yeah. <laughs> but a strange thing happened when I was in London. This is a true story. You can Google, you can't make this shit up, love. In 2010, I stayed with Donald Trump. We filmed in, um, in New York and the, and the uh, United Nations. And then I went to London. And in London, I transferred a guy from the United Kingdom to Australia. Now, to help expedite that process, I called in a number of political markers. Now, in the year 2010, in December, when I filmed in London, it was the worst snowstorm they ever had, the worst winter. In fact, I caught the last plane out of Heathrow. <coughs> And this guy wrote me a letter to tell me how he was adapting to his new digs in Australia. And the letter simply read, Dear Sam. And he wrote it to me in diarised form. And it read, October the 31st, thank you for all your efforts in transferring me from Leeds in the United Kingdom to my new beautiful home in Caratha, Western Australia. September the 10th, had the backyard landscape, tropical palms and rocks. No more mowing lawns for me. Another scorcher today, but I love it here. September the 15th, the temperature's up around 35. How do people get used to this kind of heat? At least it's windy today, it keeps the flies up a bit. September the 20th, fell asleep by the pool yesterday. Got 30 degree burns over 60% of my body. I missed three days of work. What a dumb thing to do. But you're right, Sam, you've got to respect the sun and the climate like this. September the 30th. Didn't notice Kitty, our cat, sneak in the car before I left for work this morning. By the time I got back, Kitty had died and swiped the size of a shopping bag and stuck the upholstery. The car now smells like whiskets and cat shit. October the 4th, the temperature's up around 40 and the air conditioner in the house is rooted. The repairman came to fix it in time he's got to order apart from Perth, which is going to cost me $200. Been sleeping by the pill now, an $800,000 house, and we can't even go inside it. Why the fuck do I ever bother coming here? <laughs> October the 20th, finally got the air conditioner fixed. It costs $1,500 and gets the temperature down around 39 degrees. <laughs> but the humidity makes it feel like 138. 
November the 1st. If one more smart ass says, hot enough for you today, I'm going to fucking throttle him. By the time I get to work, the car radiator is boiling over and I smell like baked cat. <clears throat> November the 10th. Try to run some errands after work. Wore shorts, sat in a black leather upholstery. I lost two layers of flesh, all the hair in the backs of my legs and my friggin' ass. Now the car smells like burnt hair, fried ass and baked cat. November the 20th. Welcome to hell. He got the 39 degrees today. Now the air conditioner in the car is rooted. The repairman came to fix it and said, hot enough for you today? I had to spend the two and a half thousand dollar mortgage payment to buy myself out of jail for assaulting a stupid fucker. <laughs> Karatha, what kind of sick demented idiot want to live here? December the 1st. What? The first day of summer? You're kidding, aren't you? Just shows you you can't always get it right. Same as this topic is a, is a point of conjecture. It oscillates from one to the other. We mentioned New Zealand once before. Now, New Zealand's also very close to my heart. Now, to here you might know, but I, I do a bit of ventriloquy as well. I've been practicing ventriloquy. And I ended up going to a farm in New Zealand. They took me to a farm in New Zealand. And on the porch of the veranda of the farm was a farmer and his dog. And I said to the farmer, I said, do you mind if I say hello to your dog? He said, listen, you idiot, dogs don't talk in New Zealand. He said, do you mind if I try? He said, OK. So I said, g'day, doggy. He said, g'day, Sam, how you doing? No, more importantly, how you doing? Oh, he said, I'm living the dream. It's utopia. The master takes me for a walk. I get fed state-of-the-art food. He couldn't believe it. He was almost in a catatonic state, lying on his back. I look across, I see a horse. I said, do you mind if I have a chat to your horse? He said, listen, idiot, horses definitely don't talk in New Zealand. I said, do you mind if I just try? So I said, hello, horsey. He said, g'day, Sam, how you doing? I said, fine, how you doing? Oh, he said, I am living the dream. Farmer throws a saddle over me, we go to the undulating plains of New Zealand. It, life is just a ball. The farmer by now is absolutely besotted. And look over there in the paddock and I see a sheep. And I said, do you mind? He said, the sheep's a fucking liar. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night. Au revoir. Keep it going for our ambassador, ladies and gentlemen. Great work, Sam. Our last speaker tonight for the negative, ladies and gentlemen. We're very lucky to get him up from Sydney. Tahir, he's an Aussie comedian, film and television actor of Turkish descent. He has a huge collection of credits and has concepted, co-created and starred in two sitcoms, Street Smart and Here Comes the Habibs. He's also a local Logie winning actor, having starred in Fat Pizza, Swift and Shift Couriers and Housos as well as three feature films. Please welcome our guest, Tahir. Thank you so much. Uh, I didn't think I was going to be on after a marathon, I'll be honest with you. Um, so do you have the energy to still listen to my arguments, ladies and gentlemen? Yes? Yeah. This is my first time in Rockhampton. I'm excited. My debut in Rockhampton. And uh, no photos, please, no photos. I'm on compo. I shouldn't be working. I don't know, there could be government officials, I'm not sure. Welcome to tonight's charity debate. I'm joking, I'm joking. Get this, get, get this photo. And the main reason I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be honest, the main reason I'm here is because um, JobKeeper's finished. I'm going to start working again. 
It's, it's been fun. People have been negative. Like, you know, like, if it's fun. We have to be... People get so negative all around Australia that they do that Chinese thing with the needles. What do you call it? Um, heroin. Right? And, uh, <laughs> it's wrong. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard some arguments. I'm going to stick to the arguments, right? Men are not as romantic as women. I'll prove this point through facts and personal stories as evidence. A, a recent university study, three million mobile phone subscribers found that women are 77% more inclined to invest heavily in creating and maintaining a romantic bond. The study discovered women are more focused. Did you hear that, men? Of course not, because men are not focused. They're just sitting there thinking about food, sport, and breasts. Australian men especially are not that romantic. They reckon that French people make the best lovers. Do you agree? No, the Chinese make them cheaper. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, from my own personal stories as examples and evidence to prove our point that men are not more romantic. For example, my partner, to spice things up, true story, to add some romance, she said she bought some female crutchless undies. Yeah, do you know what that is? <laughs> Jeff doesn't know. I didn't know either, Jeff. I didn't know either. Let me explain. They're female undies with this bit here missing. Missing! Now, my wife's got them on in the bedroom, nothing but those on, just to surprise me for romance. I walk in. She's laying on her bed like, hey, do you want some of this? I'm like, no. Look what it's done to your undies. games, right? Fredo knows this. Females love to play doctors, don't they? They love to play doctors in the bedroom. You do, you horny devil. How do you play doctors, Fredo? How do you play? Doctors in it slowly. Huh? I played myself for one hour. One hour in the bedroom. You know how to make it last for one hour, men? You keep in the waiting room for 57 minutes. My partner wants, wants more, more romance. She wanted foreplay. Foreplay for men is taking the clothes off. That's it. That is our foreplay. And she said, oh, give me a sign. Give me a sign if you want to have sex with me. That's what she said to me. She said, me. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, you know, kids are met. It's all quiet. This is her idea of romance. And I didn't understand as a man. That's my point. Men are not romantic. She said, we're, we're in bed. It's all quiet. If you want to have sex with me, you should reach over, grab my left breast, squeeze it once. If you don't want to have sex with me, you should reach over, grab my right breast, squeeze it twice. I'm thinking, oh my God, that's too confusing for a male. <laughs> Men, we don't get that shit. We don't get it. We don't understand. I said, that's too confusing. I said, I've got a much better game plan. We're in bed, it's all quiet. If you want to have sex with me, you should reach over. Grab my penis, pull it once. <laughs> if you don't want to have sex with me, reach over, grab my penis, pull it a hundred times. Of course, do not pull any penis a hundred times, ladies and gentlemen, because if you do, you get strangulated testicles. <laughs> of course, ladies and gentlemen, with age, men certainly become even less romantic. I walked into my, into my parents once in the living room. They didn't hear me coming. And I was shocked. This is the romance I saw from Dad. Dad put his hand all over her neck, then slowly over her stomach. I was frozen. Then finally inside her thigh, until he finally found the remote. <laughs> that was it. That's my point. There's no romance with men. Welcome, welcome, come in, sit down. You know, my wife, poor wife, like honestly, she's just, 
During the lockdown, this is what happened. Like, you know, females love two things. One, cushions. We know that. Females love cushions. Can never have enough cushions, right, in the house. Two, they love to put up shelves. Now, my wife put up shelves in our main bedroom. She put up shelves on the wall. All shelves, different levels. Everywhere. Back wall, all, everywhere, shelves. And on those shelves, to make it romantic, she put soft animals, toys, prizes, all sorts of things. I thought that was a bit weird. I thought that was a bit weird. Anyway, we did it. We got out. We, we did our business. <laughs> Afterwards, I said, how was I? She said, you were shit. You can have anything from the bottom shelf. I took my prize. <laughs> Men will be never as romantic because we're too immature. This is not even a debate. Men, of course, much more immature than females. The biggest difference between a man and a woman is this. Simply, when it comes down to it, if a female says, smell this, it usually smells nice. Men need help in romance. They need help. It's true. There's single guys here who should be helping them. They're sitting there probably getting like disillusioned with all these arguments. And if there's single men out there, let me help you before we end this debate. Be very careful, right? Make sure when you pick a partner, choose a female that's good in bed. Choose a female that's a very good cook. And choose a female it's very good with conversation. But make sure these three girls never meet. <laughs> I'm trying to help people. There's young guys here, I can see. And if you are single and you're male, you can do things like this. Before you go to bed, just shave one leg only. Just one leg only. So when you go to bed, it feels like you go to bed with somebody. I'm going to finish up with a few more personal stories, ladies and gentlemen, to prove our points, which we have proven. Um, I mean, on, the, uh, on this side over here, Fredo was fantastic. He spent half the time not even not addressing the topic. Um, but he was pretty funny. The second half of the speech was funny. And of course, Christine and Sam, they actually argued for us. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I mean, look, these are all personal stories, you know. I was told once to make eye contact during orgasm. Has any, any man been ever told this? Make eye contact during orgasm? I thought I'd try it. I tried it. I looked straight in her eye. And she looked very, very angry. Why? Because she was looking through the window when I was having one. Females try things. They try things like, you know, uh, to try to get us men more romantic. It doesn't work. I feel sorry for you females. It just doesn't work. My wife said, oh, talk dirty to me. Have you ever had that conversation? Talk dirty. I didn't know what to say. Talk dirty to me. I said, oh, well, I left the clothes on the floor, the plates in the sink kitchen, and I didn't flush. Is that dirty enough? <laughs> Lane German. I'm going to close the argument now by sticking roughly to time. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm at the back end of it. And I'd like to just point out that uh, Fredo uh, was fantastic. Yeah, he was good, but he didn't really spend time on the topic. I, I hope they got some points coming back because we've made very, very good points. And uh, of course, the book signing from uh, Fantastic. <laughs> Tomorrow, make sure you turn up for the book signing. And Christine, the principal, like, you know, talking about trucker hats and gifts, proving our point. She was actually arguing for our, like, shit gifts, arguing our point. And Sam was fantastic. I couldn't believe he's one of our strongest arguments for our time. <laughs> Running out of conversation, but our small bar bathroom, just all our points. So I love that. Thank you so much for arguing on our behalf. So we've got actually five and a half speakers here for arguing for one team. 
and Fredo second half. So you, you people judge. Keep it going, ladies and gentlemen, to here, up from Sydney. <clears throat> right, now we're doing a summary to sum up the arguments. Please welcome back the Ambassador, Mr. Sam or Samantha, I'm not sure. Give him a big welcome, thank you. Well, gender fluidity is very important. To hear, very, very good, but see, they're delusional. It's a new world. Having the temerity to think that women actually don't, would have a climax with him. Could you believe that? <laughs> Absolutely. They would faint at the sight of him. But anyhow, we're not here to disparage. But you vote on the evidence presented. I thought our side was terribly compelling in a very witty, eloquent way, without disparaging the opposition. Uh, I meant to say it's a very easy argument to win. And I think we did it with great aplomb. You know, Annie, I know she's got a book signing, so her focus is purely on the bottom line of the commercial, you know, benefits that may, you know, come from all that. So a bit of controversy, you know, knock the opposition. It's quite conceivable she may sell three or four in the audience here tonight. <laughs> i got no idea. Have you read it? It's a good read, yeah. It takes you 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> It's a typical ABC bio, believe me. <laughs> no, but very, very good. The next one, the sequel, will be very, very good. I have no doubt. Chris, you reminded me of the Australian Cricketing Board. You know, their scorers. It's all about statistics. Football, you know, stats, stats, stats. Drives you insane. No focus on... The performance. It's just statistics. Anyone can amass 20 or 30 overnighters, but who has that quality of association? You know, and without being disparaging to Anna, <coughs> Anna's 40 and single. Now I ask you the obvious question beckons. You know, look at us. We've had a handful of goes at it. <laughs> But that's not to say we're not very good at it. You know, I've had two or three. But I've got to say, in all my relationships, they're very, very, we've got a great rapport now. You know, relationships don't end in a very ambiguous way because, you know, you're no good in bed or you're not romantic. There's a culmination of factors, ladies and gentlemen. You know that in your own world. Some of you are slightly more tolerant than others. You know, a bit of relentlessness. You know. So all those things all add up. To here, you also got to understand, and I do know with a name like to here, uh, the derivative of a surname to here is obviously not Anglo-Saxon. It's got a European connotation. And if you know anything about Turkey, my word, their focus is on male. Women don't even count in Turkey. They're not even recognised. Women, we've got to stand up to them. Uh, well, that's not entirely true to here, but some of them. Uh, so what am I saying? I'm, I'm drifting. I thought our was so compelling, so good, and the fact that they disparaged against them is further evidence that I thought we had a resounding victory. But you will ultimately determine that. We're not seeking uh, any, uh, any charity. You vote on its merits. And clearly the outstanding performers were the two people on my right, with a modicum of help from Jeff. And the opposition, I thought, gave us a real good run for it. So I rest my case. And over to you. Please welcome back to here for a forceful summary of the negative side. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, uh, Sam. Uh, look, the man's a, romance is a product of adventure. 
experiment, out of the out of the box thinking and hunger for fresh perspective and relationships, which are all attributes of a female. Let, for example, get your tri typical Australian male man as evidence. Jeff. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you. Please come up to the microphone and answer this question. Are you more romantic than your wife? No. <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> Even the reproductive system, ladies and gentlemen, is, uh, is, you know, the female reproductive system is more, even more romantic than the male one. Because the females, as we pointed out, well, Simon, like, you know, produce one egg. One egg! Fredo, you know this, right? One egg, that's it! Females produce one egg and say, here, fight over it. <laughs> fight over it! And the males produce millions and millions of sperm. Millions and millions! And because it's, it's a male thing, what is it? It's a race. It's a race, first, it has to be a competition. First the egg wins, come on, the sperms are like, come on, it's a race, come on, the first of the egg wins, come on, the sperms are all excited. And, and other sperms are like, relax, relax, take it easy. We just pass the tonsils. <laughs> it's late, come on. That joke alone is worth the win for our team. <laughs> the man's idea of romance is, is things like, you know, as, as Chris pointed out, like silly stuff like, we, we'll give our penises a nickname. That's right, that's how, that's how stupid we are. We give penis a nickname. Men, put your hand up if you, don't have your, uh, if you haven't given your penis a nickname. Put your hand up. <laughs> All of us! Because, you know, Jeff, you probably would have given... What's, what's yours? Gave Fre Fredo. <laughs> Your penis is named Fredo? Shorty. Shorty. Okay, whatever happens in the town stays in the town, I guess. <laughs> we give our penis nicknames because we don't want a stranger making 90% of our decisions. <laughs> thank you. One clap. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's late. It's late. You've been there for a while. I appreciate that. All females think that the man is controlled by his penis. Yes or no, girls? Yes. Not true. The penis has a mind of its own. <laughs> I mean, some mornings I get up, my penis has already been up for two hours. <laughs> Just watching TV with the remote control. <laughs> Give me the remote. Basically, ladies and gentlemen, when it all comes down to it, you know, Thank you to my team. Thank you to the opposition as well. Good arguments, but like next time, maybe stick to the time and topic <laughs> and argue for our team. Like I've had to come on late and you guys have done really, really well, but thanks to Anna. Go to a book signing, buy a book, support your local. And Simon, excellent. Uh, I learned a lot of things from your speech. Thank you so much. <laughs> and when it comes down to it, Lane Gemin, it, uh, it's true. The opposition has touched on it. Man, the, the man is simple. Man is simple. If you take a date, for example, any date, We've all been there at the start. We've all been there. Romantic date. You're sitting there. What's a female thinking? Let's have some music. Going to the chapel and we're gonna get married. Going Thank you. to the chapel and we're Thank you. Is the man thinking that? No. Play it. This is what he's thinking. We all know. Beautiful timing. <laughs> Rockhampton, were you on delay? Thank you, sound guy. That was perfect. So glad I entrusted you to win my big finish. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, um, Rockhampton has been fantastic. Hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you. The moment of truth, ladies and gentlemen, the heralded cup. Now it's time to vote.
was the, your largest cheer if you thought the affirmative won tonight's debate. Cheer for the affirmative, please. <laughs> if you thought the negative put up a good argument, cheer for them, please. <laughs> Hang on, we'll do that again. It was pretty close. For the affirmative. One more time. <laughs> For the negative. It was close, but it was just those bonus points of that mystery word. Ladies and gentlemen, the winners, the negative team. Jeff, I didn't want to give this to, uh, to Jeff because he's been part of the uh, debate for quite a while and uh, we, you know, we've used him, but um, this is, thank you for emceeing. This is just one of my tea towels. I don't know if you can see it on, on camera there. Don't worry, nobody's doing me either. <laughs> and, there's, and there's some dirty dishes there. That's for you, Jeff. Thank you, Alison, for picking me up as well. Thank you so much. Congratulations to the negative team. Thank you for coming. And Brad, Brad Cox will be coming on in about 20 minutes. So thanks very much, Rocky.